today on Light of the Word with Pastor Ray. Where do wars and fights come from? I'll tell you what the will of God is, church. That I know that I know that I'm sure that I'm sure without a doubt, and I can say it every day, every hour, and every moment, God's will is peace. And that we might live peaceably, if at all possible, one with another. God's will is not war. So we can know your We come before you, Jesus. Speak to our hearts as we discover your us. How wide, how deep, how far. Pour into us so we can learn to follow. One surrender at a time. You have made the way for us to know you. A path that's straight. Do you know the will of God for your life? Pastor Ray does. It's to live in peace with others. We know that it's not always possible, but are you doing everything you can do to be at peace with the people around you? It might mean swallowing your pride and apologizing for things you've done wrong. It might mean forgiving what's been done to you. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to be in relationships that are covered in the peace of God? Pastor Ray has more to share about that piece today. Well, let's join Pastor Ray in the book of James chapter 3 for today's edition of Light of the Word. Let's read it. James chapter 3, verse 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in meekness of wisdom. Meekness, power under control. That was Jesus. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. All these notes are online, but those were the verses, that verse 15. Where does all this come from? Earthly, the world, sensual, our very lust of our flesh, or demonic, the devil himself. Verse 16, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and everything are there confusion we said just what it does causes confusion but evil thing with the definition of that was empty here's the empty things are here when it comes from self-seeking and this is what is being spoken of there's no chapter breaks in these epistles we're really just reading continually right through into where he goes where do wars and fights come from well he's telling us 13, 14, 15, 16, and then in 17 he says, but the wisdom that is from above is first birth. He's going to tell us what is wisdom from above, but it's also still going with what isn't. So anything that's contrary to what I'm going to say here, first pure, things that are impure, it's not wisdom from above. Peaceable, anything that's not peaceable, it's not from the Lord. Gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, that word full means to control. Wisdom that's from above, it's in control. It's under the control of mercy. And you can see how this does, none of that plays into where verse 1 of chapter 4 is. Willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And that's verse 18 is going to come into a great play. Where do wars and fights come from? from verses 13 through 18, either being verse 13 through um, 16 or not, verse 17 through 18. Verse 2, you lost and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You lost. You have murder. Do you think they were actually murdering one another? Of course not. But we know what Jesus says in Matthew 5. If you have hatred in your heart, 
I consider you guilty of murder. Here they are. They're scattered because of religious persecution. And here they come, and it says in the context, among you, and here they come with hatred towards one another. You know, the last man standing. We're the last man standing. There's nothing new under the sun. And as we watch the wave go more and more and more and more, we're watching it come against the church, even the church of America. And yet here we see nothing new under the sun, just like these people. You're scattered. You're under religious persecution. You found some safe haven, and you're all settled in together. Then you find yourself coming against each other in hatred. And what is it again? It's verse 13 through 18. That's what we have here in the context. You murder. You have hatred for one another. How can this be? And it builds, and this is the point where keep building, because what I want to tell you here is, If you have murder, yeah, I'm calling it murder. If you have murder in your heart, a hatred towards your brother or sister, will never think that God's going to draw near to you. He's telling us why he won't draw near. We can't go, draw near to me, speak to me, tell me about my job, tell me about this situation, tell me about, you know, all these type of things. And God says, I want to talk to you about that person that you hate. might even be your spouse. might be that brother in the church. It might be that you're not bringing a peace. Now, I don't really want to talk about that, Lord. I really need to talk to you about right now. I need this relationship in my life. Right now, Lord, I really need a better job and more stability in my life. And God says, you ask, you don't get because you're asking all the wrong things. What you need to be asking me is how can I make peace with my brother? How can I have peace in my marriage? How can I have peace with that relationship that's going on 10, 20, 30 years that just hasn't been right for whatever reason it may be? Because he's going to say, you ask a miss. You ask and do not receive, verse 3. Because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Are you tired of fighting? Just a quick reminder of James chapter 1 verse 4. Let peace have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. It's been our theme of our book and our study for two months now. In verse 5, it's a promise. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives all liberally. It's like the throne and the water breaking forth, flowing, will bring teeming new life and bring what was dead to life, what was stale and stagnant, and it will be given to him. And I love it because in verse 5 he says, without reproach. It means he's not going to reprove us. He's not going to say, are you serious You're going to talk to me about this again. He was like, yes, please talk to me about this again. I want to give you this wisdom. I want to give you this life. I like the King James start of this because a new King James read, you ask and do not receive. I like the King James as to what I've remembered the most. You have not because you ask not. He's just simply saying, man, you want this. I'll give it to you. But you got to ask in my will. You got to ask in my way. You got to ask according to my heart and these type of things. But you know what prayer is? And again, God wants to speak to us. And He says, You have not because you ask not. It's about drawing near to God. And I think one of the greatest destructions of prayer is the prayer checklist. I got this checklist, and I got to pray for Aunt Betty. I got to pray for Uncle Johnny, and oh, I got to pray for so-and-so with the ingrown toenail, and yeah, we should. But you know what prayer is, and and what I want to call Tuesday night, it's a prayer encounter. We're here to encounter Jesus. Every morning we should be looking forward to, I get to encounter Jesus. And so I'm not seeking the hand, I'm seeking the giver. 
And I get to spend time with him. And, you know, sometimes when, you're, when you start into that, I'm just seeking you. I'm, I'm coming into a prayer encounter. You kind of come and you're, you've reached your, your time. It's time to go to work. It's time to whatever. And you go, Lord, uh, I didn't ask for all these things, but you know, you'll, you'll take care of them because I trust you. Prayer is reporting for duty. It's not a checklist, a command of, Lord, here's what we need. It's, it's Lord, what's your will today? Lord, what, what, where's your heart today and where would your heart lead us? But he tells us in the second half of verse 3, why? Because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. This isn't an isolated thought that he's coming to a new thought. He's building all the way from where we've been. He's building all the way from where we've been through our whole study back as we started. We, you know, we started with the test of trials. The test of, then we went in the test of temptation. Then we went in to the test of being doers of the word and not hearers only. Then here we were, we're looking at the, the test of real faith that shows up in real life. You know, the heart, and as we say it, the, the whole heart of this book of James is faith. Show me your faith, I'll show you my works. And what do we say is, our faith should be a faith that works. And this is a faith that works when it works and it brings peace, when it works and it brings unity, when it works and it asks not for selfish gain, but it asks in accordance with the will of God. What is your will, Lord? What's your heart? And he's going to keep building on this, and so I won't teach that in this point. I'll just keep building on it as we look at these things. You know what word is almost missing in today's world? Vocabulary. Please, that's a good one. Selfish. Does anybody even say, that is so selfish? Or do we even say it of ourselves? I am being so selfish. Sometimes we don't even realize it because it's not a word that we even say anymore. I'm being so selfish. Where do wars and fights come from? I'll tell you what the will of God is, church. That I know that I know that I'm sure that I'm sure without a doubt, and I can say it every day, every hour, and every moment, God's will is peace. Peace. And that we might live peaceably, if at all possible, one with another. God's will is not war. Oh, I'm going to say the word especially, but it's not even true. He wants no war anywhere. War on this world, it's not his heart. And yet war has become so acceptable that I think it becomes something that just becomes part of our very being, even amongst our families, in our homes, under our roofs, within the walls of the church. I've been continually approached. I, I get emails all the time from people that I even have great relationships with. But from the onset and the beginning, prayer requests for the Ukraine, and we should and I do. You know who else needs prayer? The people of Russia. Do you understand what they're living under? And I get this continual, it seems like, Vladimir Putin is an evil man. He's a selfish man. He's a tyrant, brutal man. He's a murderer. He will face the judgment of God if he does not repent. But I'll tell you what. I've been to Russia 1993, I've been to the Ukraine in 1995, and it is impossible for me to pray anything except peace, love, provision for the Russian people. I pray for the Ukrainians. It's going to be a cold winter. We need to pray. That's Putin's plan. I can't, I can't get you with my military force. It's not what I thought it was, but I can keep sending some long-range missile. Now they're down to just cheap stuff. They take a couple thousand dollar drone, throw a couple you know thousand dollar bomb on it, and fly it into you know um, power grids and the whatnot. These people are freezing. Some of them, their water's getting. I mean, I've been there, and I told the story. When I was there, Russia and the Ukraine. And only, I, only this can happen to me, by the way, but 
there wasn't enough hot water to, for the city. So the left side of the street got hot water Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The right side of the street got hot water Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And Sunday, nobody got hot water. And so when I'm in, in Russia and the Ukraine, uh, and it can only happen in my, you know, economy of life is, hey, Ray, you're going to be, st- and, and no one did this purposely, just so you know, but hey, Ray, you're going to be staying with so-and-so uh, when we get into this town. Then tomorrow you're going to go and you're going to be doing ministry here and you're going to stay in so-and-so's life. I'm telling you, the whole two weeks that I was there, if it was Monday, I was on the right side of the street. And if it was Tuesday, I was on the left side of the street. I went two weeks with no hot water. It was so cold. I'm there in October. It ain't even talking January coming up, December. I would wash my hair much more so then. And I would want, and it feel like it was breaking. It was so cold. If I like, I could feel like I go, man, I'm going to look down and there's just going to be all this broken hair. It was so cold when I would take this shower and, and this is Putin's plan and it's an evil plan. Where do wars and rumors, uh, uh, rumors of war, I always want to say, but uh, I think rumors of war, totally out of context, but I think rumors of war in the church is gossip. So uh, just be careful about that. But I tell you, God's will is peace. And I tell the story, and you may go, this doesn't make story. Is he trying to jam something in just for entertainment or something? I'm not. I remember we were doing, this was Russia, 93. We took in a bin, 70 pounds of candies and chocolates, and we were doing the inductive Bible study. Some of you got to meet Pastor Ted when he was here in June, and we did the inductive Bible study. And people would come from days, like two, three days, taking off work, taking train rides to get there. And then we took care of them. We put them in the hotel. We fed them and everything because, like, they don't get vacation pay. So I remember this one elderly man, older man. He had to be in his mid-70s. He had come, and Christianity and Jesus Christ, it's all new to them, really. I mean, it's like they're some of the most mature people there were saved for two two years at the most. And so when everybody was at, at lunch, I my role was to come back early and take a handful of candies and put them in front of everybody's desk so they have that treat. Then you know that little sugar joy for the second half of a longer day after you eat and and these type of things. And I'll never forget this guy coming in. Very distinguished. I don't know, but I think maybe possibly his past was part of the KGB. Then now he's given his life to Christ. And he comes in. And I remember I'm standing across the room and I see him. And I see him come in. And he looks down and he sees a handful of chocolate American candies. And I remember seeing him look. And I remember seeing him looking up to heaven. And just the like he was ready to go into tears and he was just waving his hand and he was giving thanks to the Lord for this candy, a handful of candy. A man was giving thanks for a handful of candy. And you can say, what does that have to do with the point that you're making? Everything I just did with you, that was almost 30 years ago. I can see his face. I can see his clothes. I see his hair. I see his candy. I see his hands risen up. And my heart goes, that's the people of Russia. And that's the people who live across the street. That's the people who are in the next state. That's the political party that we may have animosity or resentment to. And that could be the very person that God has put in your life that loves with an unending depths of love. And he says, My will is always peace. Where do wars come from? Do they not come from you're just being selfish and your selfishness is going to blow up and tear down these relationships. We can't live with, I'm happy that 90% of my relationships are well. We must strive for, I want every relationship to bring you glory and great glory. Verse 4, as we move on and 
adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that the friendship with the world is enmity, war with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Simply, he's saying you can't have one foot in, one foot out. Adulterers, adulteresses, were they really in physical adultery? No. He's talking about their spiritual condition. In their selfishness, I want something that's really not mine. And I'll fight and I'll burn it down if I have to. Whatever it takes to get my selfish ways. God says you can't be living like that. Spiritual adultery. You're not at peace with me. You have not because you ask not, because you ask amiss. You can't think that you're going to draw near to me if you're living in one foot in, one foot out. I think of Joshua in um, Joshua 24 as he came into the promised land and he says to the, the whole nation of Israel, choose this day who you'll serve. As for me and my house, we choose to serve the Lord. He's saying, there's no halfway in, there's no halfway out, there's no going back to Egypt, there's not even going back across the river, wandering the desert. It's all or nothing. As for me and my house, we choose to serve the Lord. And you know what he was calling? It was a battle cry to war. Where do wars come from? Well, he's going to tell us, here comes the devil. We'll get there. Verse 5. Or do you not think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Ephesians 4. We can grieve the spirit. I think Francis Chan was the one who wrote the book, The Forgotten God. We talk about the father. We talk about the son. And I think it's so true. And I, th I thought the book was well. The, the spirit of God that lives in us He's a person. In Ephesians 4, he can be grieved. And what grieves his heart is the very things of this. We ask amiss, wars among us, spiritual adultery, looking for something more, not being content with what God has given us. And that's what adultery, I'm not content, Lord. People commit adultery all the time because I'm just not content. I want more. What you've given me, I'm not satisfied with. And he says, and you'll do it in the church. You'll do it in your marriages. You'll do it among your brothers and sisters because you'll go to war because selfishness. Verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. You know, I, I started to make this the title of my message, and it just didn't fit of how to... Everything we're studying, because I call it the test of the world's influence, everything we're studying is so opposite of the world. The world says, be proud. Tell people your greatness. Wield it and yield it. Can you imagine this type of humility in the workplace tomorrow if you went in bosses and managers who would lift people up show grace but our, our point that we have here but God resists the proud and the world says be proud God says but give grace but gives grace to the humble last week we studied it and so I only tap it today Matthew 11, 28 through 30, we know, come to me all you labor, heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And I love what he says, for I am lowly and gentle. It's like the only self-description of his heart in all the Gospels. You have made the way for us to know you, a path that's straight and bright. You've been listening to Pastor Ray Bolas on Light of the Word. We've been exploring the book of James together with Pastor Ray. And after all these amazing messages, I have a question for you. Can you imagine someone living out what we have been reading in the book of James? Can you imagine the person who is quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger? Or the person who exhibits true religion by visiting widows and orphans in their affliction and keeping themselves unstained from the world? Is that person you? 
Are you living out what you've been hearing in this book? If not, James has some pretty vivid imagery to describe you, but don't take my word for it. Head back to James chapter 1 and read it for yourself. If this series has challenged and encouraged you, and you want to learn more, head on over to ccaac.org. There, you'll find so many more messages to spur you on in your walk of faith. Once again, that website is ccaac.org. Light of the Word comes to you through the ministry of Calvary Chapel of Anne Arundel County, Maryland, in Glen Burnie, Maryland. Do you live in the area? Then come see us this Sunday at 8.30 or 10 a.m. We'd love to have you. Well, that's all we have time for today. I hope to see you again here next time on Light of the Word, illuminating the heart of God.